I've been fascinated uh, by uh, what Dale has put together in tracing and naming and shaping the maker movement. Uh, but I've also have uh, a desire to put it in the context of a lot of other things that we've done at O'Reilly and why I think it's going to be changing profoundly over the next few years. And that's really what I want to talk about here. Let's see if I can make that work. It does not look, oh, there we go. So you guys know we started as a book publisher. You know, but then we, uh, we got into conferences with things like our open source convention or our latest hot conference, which is called Strata, which is about the business of big data. Um, you know, we have a small venture firm, uh, O'Reilly Alpha Tech Ventures, that does early stage uh, ventures. And in fact, you know, we've done some investments in the makerspace, like Instructables.com, uh, which we sold to Autodesk uh, uh, last year. Uh, but what we really do at O'Reilly is we just find interesting technologies and people who are innovating at curious edges. Uh, and then we try to, in all our businesses, we try to amplify what we see happening, uh, you know, whether it's through books or conferences or investing or online or whatever else we can do. Now, what we're really trying to do is, is to help change the world by spreading the knowledge of innovators. And what... Um, you know, we do, we start watching these people who I call alpha geeks. You know, uh, this is a wonderful quote from William Gibson that I use all the time, where he said, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed yet. And there are all these people who are living in the future. And, uh, um, you know, and then we kind of say, well, is this, where is this taking us? And we think about possible consequences. And I like to trace our interest in the maker movement in some ways to this guy. Uh, because it was about that time, it was 2003, 2004, Wi-Fi was taking off, and there was this whole set of guys, this is Rob Flickinger, uh, who worked for us um, as a system administrator, but he was also really involved in this community Wi-Fi movement, and he was actually, this is a picture of him from, I think, Business Week magazine, where he'd made a Wi-Fi antenna out of a Pringles can. And it was amazing, there were these... Um, mailing lists, and you'd see uh, people debating whether you can make a better Wi-Fi antenna out of a Hunt's tomato uh, you know, <laughs> can or you know, you know, Pringles can turn out to be one of the worst antennas. You know? But it was this sort of crazy hardware innovation in this particular area. And what we took from that, of course, was, wow, Wi-Fi is meant to be ubiquitous. And of course, that turned out to be the case. But uh, Dale started really thinking a lot more about the fact that we were noticing people hacking on hardware. And so he kind of started a, a book publishing program with books like these, you know, that where he was doing uh, some hardware uh, publishing. And then he said, you know, I think this, there's more here. And that was when he, he kind of, uh, you know, came up with the idea to uh, uh, launch Make Magazine, uh, you know, and then the year after, you know, Maker Fair. You know, so by 2006, we were kind of like, wow, there's a lot happening here. You know, we have a magazine, we have a, uh, um, a um, you know, this, this event, which, uh, you know, basically a, you know, county fair with robots and manufacturing instead of with cows and, you know, horses and sheep. And, uh, you know, but it kept going from there, you know, and Dale's, uh, framing in Make Magazine was technology on your own time. And it was this idea of people having fun. But we also have observed uh, in our technology career at O'Reilly and looking at uh, the past that even though great things begin with smart people having fun, they don't end there. You know, and I've kind of come up with kind of a, 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 sort, of a, a sort of general model of innovation. It's kind of like a, a, a four-cylinder engine. Uh, and, um, you know, it starts with people having fun. You know, so think about, you know, aviation. You know, I mean, the Wright brothers actually did file some patents and so on, but there was this huge set of people who were just like, holy shit, do you think we could fly? <laughs> you know, and they weren't sitting there imagining what all the business models were going to be yet. They weren't building businesses. They were just trying to get off the ground. And, you know, before long, I, I don't know if there's a movie you guys saw about Howard Hughes, The Aviator. You know, he was originally a filmmaker, and he was like, wow, I want to make, you know, these movies about what it's like to be in a plane. And, you know, one thing led to another, eventually kind of built Hughes Aircraft. Um, similarly, you know, you look at the origin of the, of the, you know, computer industry, the Homebrew Computer Club. I've used this slide now for years. You know, I love that. There's that first Apple one made in a wood shop, you know. It's like... It, the PC industry was just like the maker movement of a few years ago. 
you know, and of course it didn't end there because somewhere along the line, uh, some of the people in that movement started thinking big, you know, and you know, these 1978, you know, people in the PC industry said, you know, we're going to put a PC on every desk and in every home. And there was this explosion of entrepreneurial activity. And before long, the Homebrew Computer Club was an industry and not just a, you know, a, 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 something that people did for fun. People were still having fun with it. But increasingly, you saw people building businesses. And, in, and increasingly, as PCs became more of a business, they became less fun, and the fun moved elsewhere. You know, it moved to the internet, it moved to other kinds of things. And so this is why the, the sort of these, the fun part and the building business part are, are sort of on different uh, strokes of the piston. Um, so again, Google, you know, thinking big, access to all the world's information. And then people actually figure out how to actually build a business. That's hard work. Uh, that's sort of stage three. And then uh, there's this notion that I'm really attached to, which is that the most successful businesses create value not just for themselves, but for society as a whole. So, you know, I, I love this uh, slide from, uh, you know, uh, Macworld, uh, or not Macworld, it was uh, WWDC, where Steve Jobs kind of said, we paid a billion dollars to developers, and I think it's now four or five. Um, uh, you know, but the, the, the iPhone was powerful because it was, good for other companies besides Apple. Uh, Google tries to think this way too. You know, this wonderful report by Hal Varian, Google's chief economist, on the economic impact of Google advertising. They're thinking about how do we measure our impact and creating value for other people, not just for ourselves. And of course, a great story of this, going back to uh, one of the previous waves of maker innovation, the auto industry came from Henry Ford, you know, who not only uh, you know, thought about new business models and new business processes, but invented things like the weekend and the, you know, and the shorter work week because he wanted uh, people to be able to use his new invention, you know, have time to do it. So he was thinking systematically about this big picture. And I contrast that with, you know, what we've seen in the financial industry. I can't resist a dig at these guys who, you know, rather than creating value for society, destroyed it while trying to capture it for themselves. And I think, you know, we're in this uh, wonderful, um, you know, phase uh, where we're, we're exploring all kinds of possibilities and we're creating value. And I want to celebrate this capitalism as opposed to that capitalism. And so I, I just want to, you know, this is a motto that we use a lot of Riley, create more value than you capture. We've tried to do that. We're trying to do that here. We're trying to celebrate what you guys are building, the future that's possible here. So if I think of this thing as an engine, you know, the first cylinder is have fun. It's pretty clear the maker movement is doing that. When you go to Maker Faire and there's 100,000 people showing up kind of just goggle-eyed at all the wonderful things that are being done, uh, that's clearly happening. But here we are now in, the, in this sort of entrepreneurial uh, you know, stage where people are starting to figure out, I can make a business of this. There's you know, dozens of you, if not uh, more, in the audience who have real multi-million dollar businesses now in this space. And uh, big companies are starting to think about it. And some of these are going to go on to be great, enormous companies. Some of them are going to go away, as often happens in these entrepreneurial revolutions. But we will have changed the world. And I think uh, one of the things that I'm you know, wanting to advocate and encourage is that as we think about these futures, we think about, we think really big and that we think about how to build systems uh, that are uh, going to be platforms for further innovation. I'll talk a bit more about that later. So, you know, where are people having fun today? You know, you kind of see a bunch of areas of the maker movement, things like, you know, Arduino and, you know, sort of hands-on electronics again. Uh, we th you see areas like 3D printing. Uh, you know, there's even crazy stuff like, you know, the open source ecology project where they're trying to rebuild a whole set of tools with which you could rebuild civilization after a disaster. What's the minimal set? You know, you have, uh, and of course you see things like Kickstarter now funding what really look like, you know, companies, you know, with, with uh, you know, the Pebble Watch uh, you know, raising over $10 million uh, from individuals crowdfunding. You know, this is, is kind of Clearly, something's happening here that's becoming a business. But what I want to remind you of is this has actually been going on for a while. This is a picture from Jeff Hahn of NYU. Uh, and he had just started a company called Perceptive Pixel at our Emerging Technologies Conference in March of 2006. 
And he was showing off this mind-blowing new technology, you know, for multi-touch displays. And he had this big multi-touch display. And, uh, you know, it was magic. Nobody had seen this stuff before. And it was kind of a homebrew rig that he had set up there. You know, he did launch a company, eventually sold, you know, the, the, one, the multi-touch things that you see on CNN and the like. But it was definitely kind of a maker-ish business. But it was only a year and a half later that we saw multi-touch in a consumer device that went on to really change the world. And uh, I, I think it's important to realize just how fast what's happening in the maker world today can blow up into enormous world-changing businesses. It won't necessarily look makerish anymore. You don't even think of the iPhone as a makerish business. And yet the technology that, you know, that kind of made that possible was being explored by, you know, by people in homebrew kind of labs uh, only a year or two before. So there's a lot of potential in what we're all doing here in the maker movement. You know, and you see this in a, in a uh, different scale with uh, something like DIY drones, Chris Anderson's uh, you know, maker uh, startup. You know, uh, seeing how far and fast this is going. If you haven't watched Vijay Kumar's TED talk with this sort of swarm uh, drones that are flying in formation, it's just mind-blowing stuff. How the tech is advancing, uh, how, how rapidly. And you know, then you know, you start seeing the business model impacts. You know, we run this event called News Foo Camp. And you know, one of the hot topics was drone journalism. You, know, you go, oh my god, this is going to change so many different fields. It's not just going to be like, oh yeah, we're selling uh, these cool kits for, you know, for families to, to work on together. It really is going to be big business. And in fact, it may be a business that's dominated by existing players, you know, like you know, um, uh, International Harvester, which makes crop dusting gr drones, you know, might say, oh yeah, we can get into the general drone business. Or it could be transformative new businesses. But you can kind of see already how uh, businesses, things that looked like they were just for fun, are already becoming businesses and, and really significant businesses uh, in, in a fairly short time. Another area, this one's really on the cusp. This is a great picture from Wikipedia, the evolution of Steve Mann's wearable computing, you know, from his early, incredibly makerish version, uh, you know, up to something that looked, uh, you know, pretty decent. And then, of course, we see, you know, Google introducing or, or, or planning to introduce their version of this, um, uh, you know, uh, in, in the not too distant future. So we see that progress from, wow, this is a fun maker project. Uh, which is interesting because it's innovative and fun, to actually, hey, people are thinking about what's this business going to be? And uh, uh, another great example, uh, this is uh, obviously a very makerish device. This is a car that was competing in the DARPA Grand Challenge in 2005. I like to point out the, the winning vehicle in 2005 went seven miles in seven hours. So six years later, you know, we have Google say, well, we have this car that's driven, you know, hundreds of thousands of miles in ordinary traffic, and they're actually, you know, gotten permission to start, uh, you know, road testing them, driving legally in, in, um, in uh, Arizona, uh, or is it Nevada? Nevada, rather. Uh, but, but it's sort of interesting, the secret sauce, what made the difference between the 2005 version and the 2006 version, turns out to be another piece of maker technology the Google Street View car, right? Because the Google Street View cars actually are a, a way of instrumenting and measuring and gathering all kinds of data from the world uh, that's then replayed by the autonomous vehicle. And that highlights something that's really, really important, the connection between the maker world and the big data world, which is the other locus of super excitement that O'Reilly is tracking. Uh, it turns out that, you know, one of the big things that's coming out of, 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 of the maker world are sensors and what you, the data that you can gather with them. I was looking at the Quantified Self website. There's now 505 tools. Many of them have a hardware component uh, for tracking personal data about yourself. I uh, met recently with an entrepreneur in, in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Who's, this is just a prototype of a stress 
uh, sensor uh, that you can wear as a watch. His target is, is veterans with PTSD. And that's actually a stress map of Cambridge, Massachusetts. You know, once you start tracking this, you can go, oh, there are certain areas that seem to be high stress for the people. You know, and, and so these guys can avoid them. And he told this very funny story. Like once you put the sensor, it's, it's not a new sensor. It's just you know, stuff that's been around in biofeedback for years. But once you can load that data, you know, and you can cross-correlate it with things like location, which, of course, you have from your phone, uh, you know, you can start asking things like, why am I stressed there? And he talked about one veteran who discovered that he was having flashbacks at every time he went to Whole Foods, you know? It's like, <laughs> go figure. Then he went to his, you know, therapist, and they kind of came up with a reason for that. But, you know, the fact that he was able to do that monitoring totally changed uh, the way he, he would think about things. Um, you know, here's another thing that's changing. You know, SF Park initiative in San Francisco, uh, you know, sensor-enabled parking meters. You know, so it's becoming more industrial. And, and actually, when Steve uh, Hoover and I were talking uh, um, right before, um, um, you know, this meeting, you know, we, we, you know, he was saying, well, you know, you could use the same technology uh, in a peer-to-peer -peer way. Uh, you know, to actually rent your driveway in much the same way that people are starting to, in a peer-to-peer -peer way, uh, you know, rent their cars to each other. By the way, interesting thing, too, on this progression, this maker progression, Relay Rides, you know, a company that's a little bit like Zipcar, but peer-to-peer, -peer, started out with their own hardware device, which they try to get people to install. Again, very maker-ish. But they just made a deal with GM where any OnStar-equipped car will be able to be part of the Relay Rides network. So you start to see you know, that progression of the maker businesses or the maker-enabled businesses connecting into you know, an ecosystem that allows uh, for a new business model. And uh, come on, this is not working very well going forward. Um, you know, uh, I was talking with Jeff Immelt of GE recently. He's pushing this whole notion of the industrial internet, asking questions about how will GE's different business be different when they actually all the devices are connected or uploading data? How does open data play into that? So there's a whole world of change uh, that's coming. And I wanted to finish uh, with uh, this slide from uh, Roger McNamee. It's actually a pointer to an interview that he did. Now, Roger is uh, you know, a well-known Silicon Valley investor. And about nine minutes into this interview on Pando Daily, he says something that's really, really important. He's talking about content, but he really points out that when you have a hardware transition, that everything becomes different. You know? And he's kind of saying, we're in this cusp. He's focused particularly on the iPhone. You know, and he, he actually has this band that's kind of Grateful Dead knockoff type band. Uh, um, you know, they, they're actually very, very successful. They've actually had two million copies of their concerts downloaded. They film their entire concert with, for 300 bucks with five iPhones. It's in HD, mixed live. Uh, you know, it's just an amazing thing. And he's just saying, you know, this is this whole new network, whole new uh, set of possibilities. And the point I would just make here is that we're now on the cusp of another revolution. It's not this going to be as big or bigger than the smartphone revolution. The smartphone is just part of it. Everything sensor enabled, everything you know, with, with all kinds of new hardware angles. And everything is going to be uh, uh, different, possibly. And we have a huge opportunity here for business and not just for doing cool stuff. And uh, so I want to finish with uh, you know, a quote from you know, uh, legendary Park alumnus Alan Kay, he said, it's easier to invent the future than it is to predict it. I don't know where all this is going to go. I just know there's some really cool things happening. And you guys are dead center in the middle of it. And so, you know, I want to uh, sort of cheerlead and help you guys invent that future. Thank you. <laughs>